Thank you, David. And uh, one more round of applause for David, who put this whole thing together. So thank you so much. You guys are all very uh, lucky, very blessed to have uh, somebody organizing a community like this. We do a lot of community talks, and it's not often that you find somebody with so much passion in doing this day with us. So definitely take advantage of that since he's leaving all this. Excellent. I'm trying to figure out what it's got to do, but I've got about four minutes. I've got my name tag for folks. Anyway, uh, this is John Papa, my name is Dan Wally. Uh, John, you can go quickly and introduce yourself since I'm not really going to put the words out today. It's true. Uh, I'm John Papa, I'm from the United States, I live in Florida. And I've been working with web technologies for about 10 years and in this industry for almost 20. And I build everything from databases to front end to mobile to pretty much anything else that you guys can see out there. And I'd love to train and teach and make fun of Dan. Yes. I'd like to make fun of John. That's <laughs> not all we do. But uh, yes, my name is Dan Wally. I live in uh, Arizona in the United States. So John's on the kind of east coast, I'm on the west coast uh, side. So we're, we're pretty close, so we're only like a five hour flight. Yeah. Really close. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm on a consulting company called Long Consulting, and kind of same as uh, John for the most part, a lot of web stuff nowadays. And uh, Angular's a big part of it. So John and I were super excited to be here. Um, John, I don't know how many months ago, had originally Skyped me and said, hey, you know, what do you think about three months? Three months ago? So we are going to be in Barcelona, and I'm like, uh, I've been to Spain, my, uh, my wife's grandma is from Spain, from Lindsay, here. So I'm like, and we got to come like 20 years ago, my son's in the back, he was still in the belly, he came. Now he's 21, he's in the back, but, uh, so I'm like, yeah, we want to go back, we love Spain, last time we were here. And uh, so we're really excited to be here, and thanks again for giving the opportunity. We should uh, embarrass your children a little bit more. Hey, Danny, Jeff, raise your hands back there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the babies who now are strong enough to take me down. <laughs> so, all right, we well, only have about 40 minutes here. So, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about building an Angular 2 app and some of the fundamentals. Uh, John uh, read up on the way. I don't know anything about it. I'm just going to do it. Uh, where is it? Why are we here? Uh, so what we're going to do is go through a real simple kind of app and start with it. And we'll start adding some basic features. And that way those of you that are new to Angular 2 can kind of get a feel for what it is going to happen. Like I said about, well, what, 35 minutes now? Yes, 35. So I better shut up. But uh, we really are told it is when we give you guys enough uh, Kind of knowledge to get started. So, how do you do an angle one? Right now. Check this out. How many have never done any angular at all? Ever? Yeah, we are. That's good. Let's go. Let's see my words. And how many of you are here just for beer? That's actually the smart ones in the room. <laughs> Wait, I listened for about an hour to free beer. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> and then what we're done talking about, we're going to talk about build an Angular app. We're going to show you how to build some things and how to think about it. And then Carlos, this guy I was pointing at, Carlos is going to come up and show you how to build a whole Angular application. So by the time you get done, you have a pretty good feel for our uh, work. So let's jump right in. Um, if you're on Twitter, feel free to get in touch. Uh, this way, our blog director is well, so we'll need this up real quick. Uh, we're pretty active on the whole social media thing, but we apparently need to get lives on it. Yes. But uh, at least that's what our minds are <laughs> But uh, so what we're going to do, I have a little GitHub site uh, called Angular 2 Bare Bones. And it's a very simple starter project. Uh, we're going to show you another way you can get started, but we're going to work with a project that's up on GitHub, and Tom and I are going to kind of put together some demos here. Uh, so the link for what we're going to do is right here. That's all the slides we have. We only have about 35 minutes here, so we don't have a lot of slides. We're going to jump kind of right into the, uh, the code here. So uh, real quick, if you could, we're going to go there in a moment. If you go to Angular 
Java.io, you can actually get to something called the Quick Start. Tell us about Quick Start. Now, why would I want to use it? So the Angular IO site is all for Angular 2. They move all the content there. And Angular IO docs is where you find all the documentation for Angular 2. Part of that has a quick start. The quick start is the easiest way to get started with Angular 2 today. And if you follow the steps, you'll end up exactly where Dan's code uh, begins today. So if you've never done it before, you can come off with a five minute quick start. And uh, it doesn't take five minutes today, it's more like 20. But uh, <laughs> it'll be about five minutes once they work out a few other issues. So this will get you through set, getting set up with Angular, getting NPM installed, kind of making sure you have what you need, and then getting a basic Angular 2 application. And then also on the back, you can see there's not only a quick start, but there's a tutorial. The tutorial is a seven chapter tutorial, step by step, on how to build an Angular application line by line. And it actually lets you run the code live, so you can read it and read the code and actually run it on the internet as you go. And then below that, we've got the basics, developer and have cookbooks. There's just other ways you can look at the same docs. The cookbook is great for answering questions like, how do I do this, or how do I do that? Uh, and then finally, there's a API reference on the left-hand side. This is my favorite one, actually. Yeah, this will let you actually go ahead and search for different modules. When we talk about modules, classes, uh, decorators, anything that Angular 2 uses. Uh, for instance, we'll talk about something called Automit. Those of you in the workshop, you already saw this part, but uh, this kind of tells you the model, and you can drill down in, and you get some info about what it is. It's a really nice way to uh, kind of easily see you know, all the stuff that's available. And it kind of dynamically filters. So if I want to see all the directives that are supported, I can just click on that, and it shows me just directives. Uh, if I want to go to classes in the framework, I can do that. And so it's actually a really great way. In fact, it's, it's useful enough that I have an API docs area. Uh, you can see I have this API 2.0 preview right here in my bookmarks. And that's something I go to fairly frequently. So I just bookmark right there. So having said that, uh, this bare bones kind of starts us off with a really simple app, I'm going to show you how phenomenal this app is. You'll be blown away by coolness. Um, so brace yourselves. Brace yourselves. Uh, yeah, there's the home page. And yeah, there's the second page. Oh, yeah. That's exciting, man. It's bare bones, all right? It's a great way to start. It's more than hello world. It does have a little bit of rallying, you know, a little bit more components than just hello world. But it's a good way to start. Uh, very, very simple. So, all right, what do we want to start with? Well, the list we have is why don't we take a look at a component and we'll talk about how we get data onto the screen. Okay. Do you want to start at the actual web page itself? Yes. Okay. So, let's walk through this. So, first off, uh, one of the things you'll know with Angular is that Angular, Angular 2, I should say, to clarify, is that we have something called modules. And modules are kind of like buckets that holds specific functionality. All right, so for instance, there's an Angular core. There's Angular HTTP, that's for things like Ajax calls and such. Angular routing, and these are built in, uh, and they're all defined in a package.json file. So you'll notice that I have all these guys uh, that are defined here. And these guys here, like right now we're at release candidate four, that's the latest as of today, until maybe tomorrow, who knows? The release candidate five will be coming out. But these are the buckets right here. Okay, so if you've ever worked with a framework out there that's kind of like a, a library, and you have the fictions over here, and the non-fictions over here, uh, that's, that's kind of how this works. Uh, you have to know sort of where to go. That's why we showed you that API reference. Because you can go there and figure out all the modules. Now, the, we're not going to be using all these in the time we have, but these are where the functionality is going to be pulled. So we're going to be using uh, something called npm. You'll notice that I have a little command line type thing running right here. This is actually my little web server. I don't know where that text that it's from. It's from the Google slides. It's sticking around. But anyway, uh, this is a little you know, guy here that I can stop it real quick. Let me just show you the basics. I'm going to kill this guy. We can probably shut that down now too. And so there's a, a README uh, for the project itself. 
that'll tell you what to do. Normally, you run an NPM install, and that's going to get all the Angular modules installed locally. All right. Then you can do npm start, and that kind of launches the web server. In fact, I'm using something called Light Server that Java put together. That's uh, a really nice little server that will help you get started. And then that kind of launches the app. And that's it. That's how easy it is to start. Now, what it did, though, is running the npm install, put a bunch of stuff in this node modules folder in this Angular area. So you'll notice common and core and forms and HTTP there. So we're going to be using that type of stuff that's in those files. Now we're not going to have time to go into all that, but we are going to talk about the basics of some of these models. So, all right, so go back and let's walk us through real quick on the, uh, the home page. Now that should be the end. So those of you who have used uh, any Angular 1 or Backbone or Durandal, things like that, in the past, or even just jQuery, Something you will notice is that this file is awfully short. There's only a couple script tags in this file. I think about four or five. Yeah, that's about it. We don't have to list, we don't have to point to every single file that we use. We just say, okay, we need to load some core files and then this application is going to figure out how to get the rest. So starting off with this, we have a shim, first of all, to help some older browsers. The shim is going to help the older browsers work with newer technology. It's very small. And then those three next files, they're pieces that help us load the modules. So effectively, when system.js is issued, which is line 26, system.js will help us load module by module, or file by file, the code that we need to use in our app. And the power of this is that in the old systems we used to write, even in Angular 1, we had to tell every single file in the framework and do that. And so it's actually a really great way. In fact, it's, it's useful enough that I have an API docs area. Um, you can see I have this API 2.0 preview right here in my bookmarks. And that's something I go to fairly frequently, so I just bookmark right there. So, having said that, um, this bare bones kind of starts us off with a really simple app. I'm going to show you how phenomenal this app is. It would be blown away by coolness. Um, so, brace yourselves. Brace yourselves. Uh, yeah, there's the home page. And yeah, there's the second page. Oh yeah. That's exciting, man. It's bare bones, all right? It's a great way to start. It's totally not the world. It does have a little bit of routing, you know, a little bit more components than just hello world. But it's a good way to start. Uh, very, very simple. So all right, what do we want to start with? Well, the list we have is why don't we take a look at a component and we'll talk about how we get data onto the screen. Okay. You want to start at the actual web page itself? Yes. Okay, so let's walk through this. So first off, uh, one of the things you'll know with Angular is that Angular, Angular 2, I should say, to clarify, is that we have something called modules. And modules are kind of like buckets that hold specific functionality. All right, so for instance, there's an Angular core. There's Angular HTTP, that's for things like Ajax calls and such. Angular routing. And these are built in, um, and they're all defined in a package.json file. So you'll notice that I have all these guys uh, that are defined here. And these guys here, like right now we're on release category 4, that's the latest as of today, until maybe tomorrow, who knows, the release category 5 will be coming out. But these are the buckets right here. Okay, so if you've ever worked with a framework out there, that's kind of like a, a library, you know, the fiction's over here, the non-fiction's over here. Uh, that's that's kind of how this works. Uh, you have to know sort of where to go. That's why we showed you that API reference. Because you can go there and figure out all the modules. Now, the, we're not going to be using all these in the time we have, but these are where the functionality is going to be pulled. So we're going to be using uh, something called MDM. You'll notice that I have a little command line type thing running here. This is actually my little web server. I don't know where that text is from. It's from the Google slides. It's sticking around. But anyway, uh, this is a little you know, guy here that I can stop it real quick. Let me just show you the basics. I'm going to kill this gap. We can probably shut that down now, too. And so there's a, a readme uh, for the project itself that will tell you what to do. Normally, you run an NPM install. And that's going to get all the Angular modules installed locally. All right? Then you can do npm start, 
And that kind of launches the web server. In fact, I'm using something called a light server that John put together. That's uh, a really nice little server that will help you get started. And then that kind of launches the app. And that's it. That's how easy it is to start. Now, what it did, though, is running the npm install put a bunch of stuff in this node modules folder in this Angular area. So you'll notice common and core and forms and HTTP there. So we're going to be using that type of stuff that's in those files. Now, we're not going to have time to go into all that, but we are going to talk about the basics of some of these modules. So, all right, so we'll go back and let's walk us through real quick on the, uh, the home page now that I showed the end. So those of you who have used uh, any Angular 1 or Backbone or Durandal, things like that, in the past, or just jQuery, something you will notice is that this file is awfully short. There's only a couple script tags in this file. I think about four or five. Yeah, that's about it. We don't have to list, we don't have to point to every single file that we use. We just say, okay, we need to load some core files and then this application is going to figure out how to get the rest. So starting off with this, we have a shim, first of all, to help small browsers. The shim is going to help mobile browsers work with newer technology. It's very small. And then those three next files, they're pieces that help us load modules. So effectively, in system.js is going to be, which is line 26. System.js will help us load module by module, or file by file, the code that we need to use in our app. And the power of this is that in the old systems we used to write, with even Angular 1, we had to tell every single file we wanted to load. Now we just tell, you know what? We're going to let System.js figure out the files we need. Because it's going to use a dependency tree to walk through our application. So down below, we've got, uh, I think someone said uh, line 45 or so. Oh, we're there you go. Line 31. We are loading and telling System to import app. Do you have app? It's a good question. I just hope you tell me. They don't know? No. <laughs> is basically our starting point. So you'll notice over here on the left, we do have a folder called app. And that actually is not enough though. So there's actually a file that we see right here, system.js config. And system.js, just to clarify, John mentioned it, is what's called an ES6 or ES2015 module loader. Does anybody play with ES6 uh, modules by chance? Okay, so not too many. It's a totally new way of working with JavaScript and importing what you need. Uh, at runtime. So this guy configures what we need. And just real quick, we don't have time to run through all this, but app is literally saying load the app folder. And then if I come on down, you see app again, and it's going to load this guy main.js. And now main.js, we're going to be using TypeScript in this app. TypeScript is a superset of ES6. So it basically sits on top of the latest JavaScript uh, spec or standard. And this uh, main.js here, this is actually the compiled output of some code that we'll show you in just a moment. So when I say system import app, it goes into this file and says, what's app? Well, app a couple of things. Number one, it's an app folder here. And that app folder has a main.js in it. And that's our main entry. Yeah, so when we say system import, going back to here, okay, really what we're saying is load main.js. Now, I could actually, without doing all that mapping, go in and do something like this, app slash main, and we figure out the JS part of it. But kind of the standard that everybody's going with as of today is this approach right here, where it's all defined in the config file and the Alright. So moving on, uh, so this takes off the whole app, and that's it. That's all the script text right there. Uh, so it's a little bit different, and we'll show you why. So should we go to main? Let's go to main. That's why it's in there. All right, so this is kind of getting started. Now this is where things get a little weird. If you haven't done it, you can do ES6 or ES2015, same term. Um, most of us are used to, you know, somebody on the team, or maybe you, if you're a team of one. Uh, Loads all your script tags, as John mentioned, into your like index homepage, you know, index HTML, whatever your homepage is. And we were joking this morning in the workshop we did, you know, how many have ever got the script tags out of order? And anyone that's done JavaScript, that's a pretty easy thing to do. Like you load something in the wrong order, and then it doesn't get a file. Or you forget a file. 
Yeah, this angular one was really easy to do. So in angular two, you'll notice right off the bat, you know, there's just a little bit of code in here. Most of the code is these imports. So uh, we'll walk through what the heck. What's an import? Yeah, so the imports are really non-functional code. They're there to help TypeScript understand where you're getting the things from. It's your dependencies. So first, let's actually start at line nine and we'll up the imports. Line nine says, I want to bootstrap Angular. Bootstrap means start it up. So to get bootstrap, I need to have a function that runs bootstrap. And that's where line one comes in. So we're importing the bootstrap function from Angular. And we should have mobile apps later, we might have a different bootstrap function because this bootstrap is bootstrapping a uh, browser version of Angular. It's saying you're going to target the browser, so we'll bootstrap for the browser. You can also target mobile devices as well. So by changing one line of code, you can change your entire platform. So they're going to bootstrap what? We have to tell it where to start. The application has a starting point, so we're telling it to start at app component. App component is the component they wrote. And on line four, it's going to be importing that app component from the file. And then he's also saying on line nine, I'm going to use the Angular router. There's a router that Angular comes with, helps with navigation. So I can have a menu from each mm -hmm. page. So we have to go get those from another file that data imports on line five. And then what's the other guy? Yeah, that one right now is not being used, but this is something else and we'll skip that one. But here's the bootstrap function. So notice that everything I need or God needs or you need, you have to import. So does anybody have done much object-oriented frameworks in here? Java, C sharp, Python, something like that? Well, you know, you always import what you need into the file. That's exactly how TypeScript and specifically ES6 works now. It's awesome because instead of relying on, you know, John to load the scripts in the proper order, John never gets the scripts right. Uh, now I am in charge. If I, if I screw this up, it's totally my fault. So that's the downside. You can't blame anyone else anymore, except for yourself. Because <laughs> you are now responsible for loading what you need. That's what the imports do. So what's going to happen is at runtime, it's going to figure out where to get these modules. These are the modules right here. So you see the platform browser dynamic, Angular Core, App Component, App Routes. And these modules, they get loaded up in memory, and then out of those buckets, you can think of a model like a bucket that holds a bunch of things, a bunch of tools. You got hammers and nails and wrenches and whatever in there. And then you tell it what it is you want out of that model. And a model can have multiple things in it. All right? For instance, this core, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the core. It's the core. <laughs> uh, that's the name. So that's kind of what we're doing. You're going to see this over and over and over as we go through this uh, tonight, that you always import exactly what you want to use in your application. Yep. And that the imports are one of the ways that the Angular and Mono system and JS know how to grab the files in the proper sequence. So it knows that we're using these things, so therefore, after it gets this file, it's going to go and get app.component. Why don't we jump there? Yep. All right, let's move to app.component. Oh, it's right above. Now, look at the very top. Look familiar? You're going to see this over and over and over in Angular 2. It's very consistent. That's over and over. We love it. If John says it one more time, I'm going to knock you over. <laughs> so, uh, now, walk us through the component, John. We obviously have this weird looking thing here. We do. So, I like to go backwards and things. And we've got this app component, but let's think about why we have this thing called app component before we describe what it is. We need to have a component which is a visual piece of real estate, of the screen. We want to put something on the screen, something on the page. Well, app component is our whole app. It's what's going to become the entire page for us. So, to have an app, we have to tell it and tell Angular how this app is defined. So the first thing you have to tell is, when you see an HTML, how do you recognize it? So line seven is our selector. So somewhere in our index HTML, we've got, uh, what do you call it? Enable bracket, app dash, uh, selector, app dash component, like that, container. And that is our entire app. So now, we told Angular, hey, when you see this tag, I know you don't know what that is, I'm telling you it's the app component. And then 
we have to define gauge, what does that mean? What actually goes in the app component? So we define our template, which is our HTML that represents that. In this case, the end is router that is using page navigation, and it's using the called router output. Router output is a placeholder saying, anytime I click on a menu item, put my HTML here. So effectively, the entire app is a router outlet. It's a place to put your content. Now, the reason we kind of created this app component is we had to tell Angular about these things. We had to tell it what the selector is. We had to tell it where the HTML is. And we had to tell it which directives we're using on the page. A directive is something that's inside of our component. In this case, we're using the router outlet. That's a router directive. And then finally, we have to tell it what services are we going to use in our application. What things do we want to share throughout the entire app? Because we always have shareable logic, shareable data, shareable state, things like logging utilities, things like error handlers, or things like data services. So these will be listed here. This is the way we basically get our app started and say, these are the things we need to even run the app all. Maybe the security service. You'll notice that we then have a, a class. Now, I might be new to some of you. This is JavaScript. It's, it's officially TypeScript, but it's, it's a class. JavaScript. Yeah, it's a massive, it's a very useful class. You can see it does pretty much nothing. Uh, it just literally is a very basic class that loads this template uh, at runtime. So, this, by the way, is called a decorator. Uh, it's metadata about the actual, or it's associated metadata with the class, you can say. Uh, now, the class doesn't do much. You'll notice the export. Anytime you see an import, whatever you're importing must be exported. And so this is an ES6 concept. Uh, most of what we're seeing here actually is just pure ES6. Uh, as a little, this is actually more ES7, which is the next version of JavaScript. Uh, but everything else here is not even really much TypeScript in this particular example. In fact, it's not really any. This is all just ES6 right here. So this is the next version of JavaScript. So all this is going to do at runtime is when you see, as John mentioned, this tag that starts right here, and then we'll start to do some code here. But this is our main startup. But you know, if we, if we just did that and there's no code behind it, you know, what's a browser do to a tag that it doesn't know about? Just ignore it. Yeah. So what we're doing is when we bootstrap it back here, this tells Angular, hey, there's going to be a component called that component. That's this guy. It has a selector called app container. Well, that's where that tag came from. Had I renamed this to app food, then it would have been an app food tag uh, somewhere else. And then the template is going to be a load of other components. Now, component is like a building block. This is the parent component. It's a big, another big bucket, you could say, that can hold other Lego blocks inside of other components, which we'll see in a moment. All right, so this is kind of uh, starting off. So, the home page loads, that loads main.js. Main.js does the bootstrap, which loads this. This then must load something else, and we'll get to that part that comes out of that. So, all right, so let's actually do something here. It's been nice, you know, walking through the code and all, but let's do something a little more fun. So you'll notice on this uh, highly sophisticated app, we have Angular 2 variables project loaded, and we have a lovely little navigation between components. Not too impressive, but let's fix it up a little bit. So I'm going to go into this. You'll notice in the folder structure, we have an app folder here. And in that app folder, I have a share, a home, and some feature. I literally named it feature as in this is a feature of the app, whatever you want to call it. Could be customers, orders, login, whatever you want. It's just a feature. We're pretending. So I'm going to go into home and you notice in here that we have home component HTML. It's going to load what you're seeing with the bare bones text. And then we have a home component TS. This is our TypeScript file. Let's go into the TS first and let's see if you guys recognize this a little bit. Okay, now based on what John just walked us through, does that maybe look a little bit familiar? There's a few differences, but it looks a little bit familiar here. So you'll notice that in this example, we're importing several things. We'll go into some of these. Here's our component that says our selector. Now notice I did a really simple tag called home. Uh, that's going to be used uh, not a whole lot, but we'll see, but it's used behind 
behind the scenes. And then here's the template. Here's some directions it needs. And then I have a service I only needed to use right now. We'll get to the service a little later. Now, this one, if I go down to the class, it's a little bit more. Okay, so this is a uh, TypeScript class. It's really an ES6 class. We're implementing the equivalent of an interface. Okay, so look up top of the imports. And notice there's the one that I import. I use the vector. On mid, I use down here. Now, we can actually, I'm in the VS Code right now. It's a great free editor if you're interested in one. Uh, I can right click and say, go to definition. And this will actually show me what is on net. Well, it looks like on net is an abstract class, meaning that it's a building block. It's kind of like an interface. All right. It defines a code contract. And what this is doing is saying that if you use this guy, then you must have this particular guy here. So let me go back now. Uh, I'm way, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. John's better than navigation. But I'm going to do it manually because it's more fun. Alright, and uh, we're going to come back in here and this NG on net. And now, let's see what happens if I mistype this just a little bit. Those that came to the workshop today used uh, an online editor, which doesn't really get any errors, but this will. This will get red, and when I mouse over it, we um, should get a little bit of air here. Now it's not popping up right now, but it usually does. Oh no, it's like, what's that? I don't know if you guys can see that I have this text that is stuck. I have no idea where it's coming from, but it's good. So, uh, anyway, let's move over here. Okay, there we go. Now I hope we can see something here. Alright, well, it's not cooperating. Oh, there we go. There we go. Took a second. So, see that little error message there? It says property ng on the bit is missing. Okay, so right off the bat, it popped my typo here. Now, if you're new to TypeScript, this is one of the big benefits of TypeScript is you can catch errors way sooner than with traditional JavaScript. Because um, we actually have a compiler running behind the scenes that's uh, kind of doing this. Now, what's going on here? Well, we notice that I have this project name that's a string. Now, this is TypeScript again. If you're new to it, we can actually define types. And if we go to the template for this component, you'll see I'm writing out project name right there. So for the angle of all folks, you'll recognize this. So let's uh, change this up a little bit. Let's say that I actually wanted to come in, and in addition to writing out right there, I love whatever the project name is so much that I want to write it out again. Let's throw it like in a text box or something. We can show a little bit of data lines. So let's go with input, type equals text. And I'm going to do something that might look a little weird at first, but John and I will explain what's going on. That's so weird. Yeah, what the heck? <laughs> Okay, and you'll notice I now have a text box that wrote the same text in the text box, but the way it did it might be a little bit unique and new to some of you. Right? The syntax maybe, maybe looks a little strange here. So uh, I'm going to walk us through what's going on here. What are we doing? I don't need it. So, alright, moving on. <laughs> so, what he did here is he took a regular HTML the input, and he's binding a property value. Project name, which happens to be in the component. So that project name in the component, which is set to any of those variables, no, like that, no. he wants to get that up into the input. So what he did is he did a property binding, which is a one way binding from the code <coughs> up to the HTML. So our object name, which is in the TypeScript file, will then go up to the HTML because he put those funky square brackets around the value. Because the value that square brackets around was saying, Angular 2, we want you to bind to this and go grab this project name the problem. So it's a one-way binding in one direction from the component up to the template. Now let's look at something here. Excellent explanation, by the way. Um, Is that right? I, I think so. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. It's hope. Is that right, Carlos? It's being recorded. So it's not going to be hope. Yes. <laughs> Let me see if, if this is project, uh, what was it, project name, I think it's the property? Yes, sir. And this is bound to project name, and if I type here, should it update this? Who thinks it should change? Yeah, who thinks it should change? Well, that's such a Everybody's like, I'm not ready to buy it. No. It's like, what? Well, John said, what type of binding is this? This is a one way binding. So as I type, it's not going to update the actual property itself. So if you want to use Angular 2, you can't ever change data. 
Venezuela slash Spain. <coughs> so uh, thankfully, Gabe yeah, back there got us out of the parking garage. That's why we were there. But I think Gabe was like, are you guys coming? Because it was like 7 and 20 that we got here. But anyway, uh, so yeah, that's my Spanish knowledge. Not very good. I, I say Pumas and Visa. I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, so let's try this out. Get ready. This is awesome. Yeah, brace yourselves for phenomenal cosmic power. Totally worth your time. Thank goodness there was food downstairs. Because otherwise, we wasted your time. No, alright, so what do you want to do with that? Well, let's do something a little bit. Let's make a 7 h 2 or something. Uh, the top of it. So we've got. We have an H2. How about when we click the button, we change the background color of the H2? Better. Alright, let's do that. So, if we're gonna, if we did this uh, earlier today, and we have really phenomenal color choosing abilities. Yes. Everybody that was here, right? Yeah, she's lying. All right, what's your favorite color? Sorry. What's your favorite color? Pink. 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 Let's do pink. Okay. Well, let's make a new property called Favorite Color, which is gonna be a string. Uh, let's default it for now to, we'll just say white. Because it already has a white background. Right? There is no background per se. Um, and let's come on in and how do we do data binding? Again, okay, what's the syntax? To get a property into a tag. Square brackets. Square brackets, good. And what we're going to do is we're going to cheat a little in the interest of time. We're going to do style dot background equals favorite color. Favorite color. Favorite color. Short term memory. If we uh, save this and go back, you'll notice that nothing really special will happen there. Okay? Because, well, you know, white anyway. We just don't want to do it because it's happening at the same time. Hey, everybody see that subtle little white background there? <laughs> pretty, pretty subtle, but yes. So, alright, when we click the button, what do we want to do here then? Well, we want to say this dot, so for this class, change the, and notice that I'm now getting some nice code colors. As I type, which is pretty awesome. It was ever typed it wrong with the wrong case before your editor. Nobody ever does that. I love these tools. It's so much easier not to screw up. We're going to go with pink. Yeah, is hot pink an actual book in uh, Yes. Is it really? Really? It's hot pink book in Ah, yes. Is there a book called Hot Pink? I learned there was another one called Long Green. Is that your favorite color? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you realize when you open your mouth here, you get any problems. Yeah, yeah. It's just that. That means we're going to We got to be Marvel Bruce or something, but. Yeah. yeah. All right, so click me. Oh. So let's run it by default. Can you 
It should auto refresh. Yes. That is the way. Before you change it, click the button. Yeah. Notice what I'm thinking. And now we can say, you know what? That's not what she said. She said pink. So you see the difference. So what's your favorite? You guys like pink or not pink? See that when you change one property, it's changing all the others. For example, when Dan types in that input, it's going down to the model, and that model has the one it binds to the property from the color on the H2. So then it updates that value. And even better is when you click the button, the button is going down to the model, changing the color, and it's changing two different properties in the screen. So all this stuff is actually doing one way binding, it's always one direction, but it's one direction at a time, and then it updates in the other direction. And that's how they get it to be much more efficient than the old way one style, which is the digest cycle. Which if you heard that before, you knew the digest cycle meant go run high because you might be really slow. Nope. Yeah, if you know what digest is, then you probably had an issue. <laughs> <laughs> and had to fix it. So alright, so uh, we're gonna have to wrap up here soon because we've got to get next time up. So, so we'll let's talk about service. Let's talk about service. Let's get some data quick and show it and do service for the Okay. So right now, take, take a look at we're in the same component. Here's your favorite color, product name, all right, same place. Check out this guy, data service. Now, what did we say you have to do if you want something? What do you have to do to get that something? That's the ask for it. I'll give you a hint, it's at the top. Import. So see this import data service from share. So dot dot means the normal go up a level. Go down to a share folder and go find something called data service dot js. Now the js is being defaulted, so you don't have to type it. But we can now look at the folder system and there's a share data service dot ts, but the ts gets compiled down to js. Okay. Let's go look at this guy. It's a very sophisticated service. <laughs> Not a whole lot yet, but notice this is the equivalent for those that have done Angular One. We had factories. Providers, services, values, constants, actually that's all, but five, you know, options. And uh, now with Angular 2, there was one option we call a service, and what is it? It's just a class. It's a really simple guy. Now this one has a big project name that is very sophisticated, <laughs> but this is where we can make an HTTP call, we can hook in web sockets, we can do Business calculations, we can do business rules, anything that's reusable across the app can go into a service class. Now, this one's very basic, those we have a get product. Okay? Now, John walked us through this guy. For those who came to the workshop today, we kind of took an informal vote of what is injectable and uh, what, is, what, is, what is not injectable. I don't think I said that right, but what is injectable mean? <laughs> data service kind of function. But if we want to inject it into somebody else, like the uh, client, oh, you like yep. that? so in there we should find data service and the return. So here, we're saying is this component needs to inject the data service. Well, this component can do so because it's got this app component on line 7. So on line 7, what that box oh, right, line 6. Line 6 does is it tells, Patrick is telling the JavaScript, I know there's type information about this class. So it's putting out that this class has a thing called data service in it. So it knows when you reference data service in line 18 how it will get it. So if we go back to the service, the data service, this guy doesn't inject anything in his constructor. So by default, he's fine and he's happy. But the minute Dan injects something in his constructor, we need to tell, TypeScript needs to tell the JavaScript that there's something that's being injected. So what injectable actually means is not that this thing is injectable, it's that it contains something injected into it. So therefore, on the constructor, maybe he injects HTTP into the service. 
and because he has that injectable on there, now Angular is aware of that type of relation fee, so then we'll get that data. Without this guy to sum it up, we counted this out. This part when it tries to inject, or in other words, go look up and get the HTTP object, the pull effect. By putting the injectable, it's basically adding just enough code that when it generates the JavaScript, because remember, this is TypeScript. But what's really running at runtime, in fact, we should probably show that real quick to wrap up, oh, sure. is what we're really running. We're not running this at runtime, we're running the compiled JavaScript. And the compiled JavaScript, well, JavaScript doesn't have this type support that TypeScript has. So this is all wrong. So what this injection will do is add just enough to say, hey, whatever's in the constructor here, Angular, you should know about something called HTTP. Then at runtime, uh, when this runs, it'll inject it and you can be off the run from here. That's nice to be real quick, I don't want you touching my keyboard. Back off. <laughs> <laughs> really? You can. Type away. So, uh, if you've done Angular once, I know a couple of you said you did. I was typing it right there. You might have seen something like this uh, data service dot dollar sign inject equals and then something like that, where you had the. Uh, yep. Is that the syntax? Yeah, that was right. So in Angular 1, the reason we did this is because inside a constructor we might refer to dollar sign HTTP. And we needed to tell JavaScript what the heck that dollar sign HTTP was. So we had to put that in a lot of code, or if it was actually the open front processes of that for you if you wanted to. But that was important because without that, Angular had no idea what the HTTP was. Because in uh oh. Now you're not sure. Where the heck did I go to? Yeah. What's your name? So in Angular 1, it had no idea what the HTTP was because it might have been minified down to something uh, really readable like X. So I guess the browser, what's X on the file? Angular doesn't know what that is. So in Angular 1, what we did is this dollar sign inject. Well, in Angular 2, we don't have that. Angular 2 is smart enough to know, look, you gave me types. I can see in line 8 you said this to a type HTTP. But when it comes, it doesn't have types of runtime. So how does it get those types to know what the state is? We use the add injectable to help TypeScript write out some JavaScript for us. It's doing that dollar sign inject for us. But this time we're not going to have any magic strings. There's no making typos with strings inside of our code. Just to kind of show you what's running real fast here to wrap up, uh, we got just a little bit and then we'll wrap up and we'll go for the next thing on on uh, yeah, yeah, so see this uh, mobile app. Yes. Carlos says it's going to make a million dollars off the app machine. Yeah. <laughs> Because everyone here is going to buy it for what was it, 100,000 each or something yeah. like that? Yeah, so he's going to get multi million. But uh, anyway, if we go into this app, this bare bones, and I'm in the Chrome uh, developer tools, let me actually uh, up this just a little plus. We can go out to sources, and how many use the uh, Chrome dev tools at all, or Firefox? Okay, good, most of them. So when I click on sources, we can go down in, into app. Here's that same folder structure, but you're going to notice right off the bat, let me move this just a tad over. We have a JS and a TS. Well, right now, this is set up that when the texture compiles, it generates what's called a map file. And the map maps the source code to the generated JavaScript. So I can actually come into app component. That's the texture right there. And I can set it right now. There's not much to do there, so let's go into home, and you'll see the TS and the JS. Now, this is actually, right here, the code that's running. Now, this is not really code you want to look at a whole lot, but, yeah, if we dig into this, though, you'll see some stuff, like here's the decorate for the whole decorator. So they're converting the pretty, in my opinion, pretty, uh, texture code into something that runs across all browsers in ES5, like the older version of JavaScript that most of us use. Okay. What's cool about this is I can actually set uh, breakpoints though in the TypeScript. You know, in fact, in this case, if I just uh, get out of here, that's not what I want actually. The wrong way with that. Okay, that's what I want. Let's just refresh this. Should hit a breakpoint over here in just a sec. There we go. We now hit the breakpoint. Right now, project name is undefined. So what's so cool about this is you can write this modern code 
and debug it as modern code. But under the covers, what are we running? Yes, five. Yes, five in this case. Now that will change. That doesn't support more and more six than more than six. But. Okay, so we've seen some data binding. We've talked about modules. We've talked about services a little bit. Uh, that's about all the time we have, actually. But anything else you want to wrap up with? No, I think this is great because it's a good starting point. If you want to go further with it, you can try out Dan's repos. Uh, we put some links to the one that I read and also kind of line out and they love John Powell. <coughs> the other thing you can do is check out the I.O. tutorials. There's a lot of great tutorials out there where you can learn how to do thing or two. And they don't just show you the code, it's not like they do any data for those. But they talk about what they're doing and why you're doing it, why these things are important. Because I think more important than seeing the code is learning why. That's how you're going to teach yourself what the next steps are. It's a little bit of a different panel model, especially if, if some, those of you that didn't raise your hand and you're doing Angular or maybe you're doing uh, jQuery, for instance. It's definitely a switch. Uh, so as John mentioned, kind of wrapping your head around the proper way to do it and why you do it is kind of half the battle because most of us are used to syntax. We can learn syntax. That's what we do. Right? The tricky part is why and you know how and what's the rationale for you know, these tutorials that Don mentioned here. They'll really help you out a lot. Uh, so I recommend if you really want to get into this, you know, walk through the five slash twenty minute <laughs> quick start tutorial, and it'll help you get started. With that, anything else? I want to see mobile app. Yeah, me too. You ready, Carlos? All right, who's ready, Carlos? Okay, 
So there's something really nice about Angular 2, and basically is that uh, we are uh, we are now the couple from the DOM. So there is one part of Angular 2 that is the writer, and that's uh, really the one that is related with the with DOM. But the rest of the platform is uh, isolated from that, and that uh, gives us uh, new opportunities in the mobile world, especially with the UIs. So let's see how this works. First, uh, I should present myself. My name is Carlos Rubio, you might not know me uh, from the Angular camp. Uh, I work in DFP and uh, I work in the Ambers project where we do this everything that we do that is open source. You will see this application there uh, tomorrow and you can play with it. Okay, so in order to talk about uh, mobile applications in, in the Angular world, let's uh, start first by uh, seeing what kind of mobile solutions we can implement with Angular 2. Uh, we are going to just follow the getting started tutorial here. I'm going to do something simple, but uh, that uh, needs uh, uh, makes you to think about uh, what, you are, what are the real benefits of doing uh, an Angular 2 application for mobile. And then we will go into the details and see the application plan. Okay, so first we have a process solutions. Basically, you can do web pages in mobile. Okay, then you have hybrid applications, hybrid applications that are web based. So that's mainly that you have a web view showing the, the UI there. Here, the most common way of doing this is using Cordova in the Angular world and the most specifically working with an Android solo. So you have uh, working with Android, you have uh, an Android solution. It uh, works with the Cordova uh, framework to have a uh, native experience and uh, that's uh, somehow a very robust uh, uh, platform already. But this is something that we could do it with Angular 1. Okay? So what, what, what are we going to do here? Well, both are going to be better with Angular 2 because many of the benefits that we have seen already, uh, but there is one special thing here. Basically, the browser solution gets much better with the progressive web apps. So we, we are able to do uh, almost native experience with, with them. And uh, we also get something new as I mentioned before. We have uh, native device now. There are two solutions here, uh, native script for once, and the other one is very native. Okay? Uh, they, are, they are slightly different because one is more focused in uh, writing code once for all the platforms and the other one is more focused in reducing the same approach in all of them but uh, you need to write it for each one of them, okay? And uh, that's a slightly different there. So, for, for this example we are going to use native script because basically I think it fits better the proposal that we are going to show that is reduced uh, between all the platforms. So, how we could do uh, this? How we can build a, a native application with, uh, with Angular 2? Well, basically, we, we can go the, the straight way and just go, get uh, the CLI, the, in this case the DNS for, for the DNS script, and start the application. We will get a pretty nice Hello World application. Then you just need to start doing the, this group, <laughs> basically, and uh, you will get a an application. But uh, you can do this uh, pretty easily with a lot of technologies. What is really powerful? What is really something that we can unleash from Angular to is basically we can do it better. And what we can do is we can reduce most of what we have seen today in the, the talk from John and Dan, we can reduce them in all the platforms. In the example that we are going to see today, uh, we are going not to the, to the full extent because we are not doing the server part with, with Angular and Universal. We are choosing Node.js with Express just to build that, an API. But even in that case, we are going to share the model. Okay? Uh, this will be the same code for all the platforms. Even the roads are going to be shared. Then, uh, there is the, the UI part. Okay? In the UI part, as I said, we are not going to render any UI in the server. And what we are going to show is the, the components and the services uh, between the mobile native application, the browser application, 
ada kualiti terus terus dan di mobile version. The only difference here the template. So you need to build a special template for each one of them. Okay, so this was just a quick introduction. Let's go and see the code because it will make a lot more sense. Okay, so the first thing we are going to see is how we can really build components that are highly reusable between uh, the, the two solutions. And we have two examples here. Uh, let's go to the, to the code. Okay. Here. So, the first of all is to, to see the structure of the project. Okay, so mainly we have a client part, common part, and a server part. Okay, there is very clear what is inside of each one of them. We will be inside them right now. And we have these three files here, but I will explain in a minute. So let's go for the client part now. And uh, in the pages folder, we have the home and the product components. Uh, I'm going to, to, sh to show you the product components because it's a bit more complex. The one is very really simple. So in the product components, we have three files. Okay? The, the TypeScript file that is shared for both of them. We can share the component here. And then we have uh, two HTML files. Okay. If you see here, uh, it's pretty similar to what we have seen uh, before with Dan and John. It's a, it's a very uh, simple TypeScript angular to uh, file. So there is nothing special here uh, for, um, for native history. Okay? Uh, there is something that we should notice, and basically, is that we are using a template URL to define which is the view that we will uh, render for this uh, application, and we are only including here one of them. This is the TNS, that's uh, the Red Street uh, view, because then we have a web pack that will help us replace this for each one of these scenarios. That's the last part we will see. But apart from that, the component is exactly the same. In, uh, in both platforms, the, the same code will be used. Then let's have a look in the, the HTML. Okay. In the HTML, we can see pretty similar structure but quite different uh, uh, markup. Okay. Basically, we have uh, regular HTML for the web version and we have uh, the uh, native script tags that will be translated into native components during the build process. But there are very familiar things here. So we have uh, seen before how we were uh, linking the, the values in the, in the, uh, in the example application for the and done. And we have seen how we were linking, for example, the events. So in the web version, we have a click element that will call the select product and the remote product methods and in the native script part we will have a tab event just because we are playing the mobile okay? this is the, the part that is different but it's similar what we are using here actually to interact with the data so the data binding is similar data binding ok, so this is one example of the same code but, uh, Let's, uh, let's see how this works. Okay. So we have one very cool application, it's pretty similar to what you did actually. So we have uh, one view, and then we have a detailed view that is calling the, the, uh, the node API, and it's basically allowing us to select a product and remove the product from, from the list. Okay, this is exactly the same behavior that we have in the, in the native application with the only difference that, well, the layout is different, of course. But, uh, I, I don't know, I don't see that in the, in the mobile don't find any, any effect when you are destroying something. It's not really a very good experience, so 
let's do something special for mobile. And in this scenario, you can just enhance what you have in the in the common file. So if you are going to do basically the same component for both with a slight difference, you can use uh, this approach that I'm going to show you now. So basically you can use a global variable to identify where you are running and then do this uh, special behavior just for the while. In the next example, we are going to see a component that is completely different between mobile and web because we have that flexibility. But if you are just going to share everything and have a special function that is different, well, that there is no more to just build separate files in that scenario. So, basically, we have the application recorded here, and well, the web is going to behave the same, but when you go Oh, it's still below the sort. It's a bit it's a bit slow uh, to reload right now. Uh, because we are going we are running many live C and it's uh, it needs to process all these SAS files one by one for the first time, just because uh, I started the emulator right in, in, the, in the presentation. So this is something that happens only in the first time that you run the, the example. Okay, so there. I will show you now how it takes really to reload. So it's basically I'm saving now in a normal scenario, not the first one. It's not like uh, in, in web because in web you already have the change there. But there it is. So now it's reloaded. So it's it's less less than a minute. So what we have done is basically include some native animation there. Okay? This is something that you can include with this approach. So you are going to write the whole component for both scenarios. Let's go with the other uh, examples here. Okay, so the second scenario is where we have uh, a, a case where the component is to be completely different between both uh, versions, okay? So in this case, you will let us just go, for example, with we have this in the menu. And in the case of the menu, uh, like this, you see that we have uh, three PNS files, so we have a different template, but we have also a different uh, SAS file, even in this case. So we are going to use the global one, we are going to overwrite it in this case for, for the menu. And then you have a specific component uh, in the script from the, the one that is going to be used in, in web. Okay? So let's look how, how this looks. So we can see here how the menu component is in in the web version, and we see here how the menu component is in the uh, native script one. So, in this case, it's really simple. The menu that we are going to implement for the web version, and uh, it's quite different how it needs to be implemented in the, in the native part. So, you have this flexibility. So, you can uh, reduce a lot of code in some scenarios, especially uh, when the components uh, uh, do not have uh, a lot of native interactions or the formal or something like that, you can reuse a lot of code, but if you have something really special, that's not a problem you can do it also without breaking the same structure. Okay, so the next case. It's uh, the shared code. This is very simple, we are going to have a look at this one quickly. So out of the client folder, we have a common folder where we have uh, three files in this case. So one is just uh, to put together the export uh, from, from the application. The other one is uh, the model 
here it's, uh, this is really convenient because uh, you have uh, consistency to the server that is going to implement the API and then you have this, uh, this consistency in both the mobile application and the web application. You can even implement validations here as, as common uh, code. And then you have the, the notes file that is then being used as part of the service invocation. So when we go the client to the service part, we have a very simple service that is actually using the roles, the roots definition that we have implemented there. And in the server code, in the server code, you have uh, some mock data that we will be in this case, and also we are use the same uh, code there. Okay, so that's what we were trying to accomplish here. And the latest scenario, it's uh, well, how this works. You have seen before that uh, when you are loading the application, you are starting the application, you are injecting what you need to use in that scenario. And you don't need the same things in web uh, than in the mobile application. Okay? Uh, so this is part of the, the part of the magic here. Let's do this part. Here. We have three main dependency uh, files here. So one is for the server. This is nothing to do with Angular. It's just a very simple external server. Okay. But then we have the uh, the native script Ultra uh, and the uh, web files. And you can see that they are they look at a high level, pretty similar, okay, but there are some slight differences here. So, in the native script file, first we need to inject, uh, so to import the uh, bootstrap that the platform is providing itself, okay. Then you load the Angular code and uh, you uh, load the native script uh, router. The router is different in mobile because it allows. Uh, it allows to extend the uh, regular Angular router that is also loaded there because both can be used. We include, for example, we have, we have seen before the router outlet. Now we have in the next step also a page router outlet that allows you to handle very easily the back of the router, for example, of the data. So it's like an extension. And we have the next step router and then the Angular uh, router here. So we have both options to use. And then, as we are running inside of a native container, we have our own uh, HTTP uh, module uh, that will be executed not by the browser, because there is no browser, but by the native platform. So, this one is the one that we need to load from the native script uh, platform. In, uh, as it's showing the same API as the uh, regular Angular HTTP uh, module, then we can use them without uh, making any difference. We just need to import one or the other. Okay? Uh, if we go to the web version, we see that we have uh, the, the bootstrap from Angular application, then we are loading the Angular core and the Angular router, nothing from uh, mobile here, and then we are going to load the HTTP provider from Angular, because this part will run in the browser. Okay? So this is if you have uh, coded uh, a lot with JavaScript or a lot with uh, strong related uh, languages, you, are, you will be familiar about how uh, sharing APIs and injecting different modules it's, it's working. Okay, so that's basically the, the difference that we have between both of them. Then, of course, in part, inside of the uh, bootstrap uh, function, we will have uh, these uh, modules. And this is one of the key points to make it work. Okay, so we have different bootstraps here, but there is one point that is quite uh, important. You have seen in uh, many places in the code uh, that we have the same file with TNS or with a web uh, user. Uh, this 
this, this is something that I, I talked a lot about uh, what you wrote. And you need some tooling to do the replacement. Uh, when you are packaging the application, you know, use the right one in, 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 one, in each one of the, uh, the, the project packages. In this case, we are doing this with Webpack. And we have, uh, we have used uh, the common uh, namespace that the native is using called Go Global. You have global.android to identify where you are running the Android platform. You don't have global.ios, but you have another way to identify this by comparing the platforms. Okay? And uh, for this example, we just prepare uh, this way. And then you have the global web that we created here, and, and that's what we are using in order to identify which code will be used in each one of the, the projects. Basically, the code here is really good. It's, it was not my one. That's a type of jet. Okay, no request. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, basically, what this is going to happen is that we will compile the package process. This will result in dead code. And the dead code will be thrown away, so it won't be part of the deployment. And uh, then, then there is a second part of there. So we are going to use uh, SAS files, okay? But uh, native script only use uh, only things to have their own uh, file identification there. So we need to replace uh, the files between native script in DNS and the web uh, files. So we, we also set up this. And uh, basically these three parts uh, properly structured in code. Then uh, using the right uh, bootstrap and uh, then using a tool like Webpack to do some uh, replacement in your code allows you to share the same code between all of the platforms. We will not recommend for a real life project to put all the code together in the same project. This is for a uh, same project, for a demo project, but you usually will have the separate code in one part, the web code in another part. And, uh, and uh, uh, you will be sharing the common components uh, probably uh, through LPM and with proper dependency management. Uh, just to give us an introduction, there are a lot of uh, other things to, to explore. Don't be afraid, do it. And basically, what's next is just you need to try. It. Go to the documentation of Angular, but uh, we have one of the things that's pretty good. Go to the documentation of native speed. Try, try the examples, you will learn doing websites from one side, doing applications from the other side in parallel. And then you can go to our uh, blog, where we will publish tomorrow this example, and uh, learn how to put everything together. Okay? Even if you are not going to do this in the next project, you will learn a lot about how component management works. So I really recommend this. And uh, yeah, keep, uh, keep on with the Twitter because we will do this tomorrow, this, this example. Okay? And uh, yeah.